there's a new documentary out, much talked about. Uh, for the most part, I think people are lukewarm, if not poor, on it, which is Salinger. Um, yeah. It, it has Shane Salerno uh, directed the movie. He co-wrote the, mm. accompanying, the accompanying book. And the complaint about Salinger has been that this is a man that so fiercely guarded his privacy for you know close to five decades um, that it feels like a violation of that privacy to make a tell-all mm. movie about him at this point. Uh, what is the responsibility there? Where does that lie? That's a really mm. good question. That's a great question. I, I really don't think is. Hey, would we say this about anybody else? I mean, there's been there's tons of public figures that have guarded their privacy over the years and have had made movies made about, about them. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Howard like, Hughes. Yeah, sure. Let's see. Yeah, there you go. So where where was everybody when that was when that was happening? Well, I, mean, I think, nobody I think, said the, I about think that. the um, you know I think the difference is. I mean, the Howard Hughes story in The Aviator wasn't really about his time of isolation where he hid from the world for so many decades. Obviously, Salinger, when he went out of the public eye, he really went out of it. He did not want any mm-hmm. part of the public eye, and he did nothing. Even though he wrote every day, he never released anything for all those decades because he didn't want to be up for public consumption. Mm-hmm. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that he is a public figure, and that's just the end, end all, be all of it all. And you can't. I mean, the, the question is, you know, if you're if you're a great classic writer, do you have? Do you really have? I mean, how much right do you really have just to just to? I mean, you have all the rights in the world to just go and say, ah, I don't want to see anybody, but you can't stop people from talking about you. And mm-hmm. uh, and you can't and and, uh, and there's just nothing you can do about that. People, look, people wanted to know what Salinger was really up to, and I think I think that if a filmmaker a, a filmmaker does it correctly, uh, no one would have no one would have any kind of complaints. What I hear about the movie is that it's just not a very good film. It's like it's also it's all, I hear I hear a lot of talk about how it's how it's overly scored with a terrible score that brings you out of it and uh, and and I hear similar complaints about the direction of the film. And so yeah. I'm like if if the movie was good, I don't think people would be asking this question. But the movie is not turning out to be something that people well, really like. It's great. Like. It's, it's, great so. it's great that you open up that segue because we're going to close the show tonight with a piece of score from Challenger. So, mm. all right. Well, um, with some of that awful score, we'll end tonight. Well, that's that's one of the number one complaints I hear about it. And you know, the score yeah. has to be bad when you hear when you hear. Um, a lot of people talking about it, you know, like right, it's right. always mentioned. And um, and I do have to say, too, this is a kind, of, kind of an insidious thing that's happening in documentaries in general. It's the overscoring of documentaries. I was watching them one the other night, which was really good, I thought, called the pruitt Igo Mess about the, uh, about the projects that were built in uh, St. Louis, in the late 40s and and how they were seen as a shining example of what the government could do for low-income families and moving them out of shacks into into high-rise buildings and then then they all they went bust because they nobody kept them up and so forth anyway this this documentary is is really good it's called the pruitt Igo mess but one of the things uh, negatives of it was that it's overscored you're like sitting there and you're just like please just let the people talk and and yeah. everything don't, don't try and don't try and manipulate me with your scoring in a documentary you know uh, i i you felt know. like i felt like that with um i know exactly what you're talking about and i felt that way with uh, standard operating procedure the Errol morris documentary it, mm-hmm. it was exactly. the, it was the com- yeah and he's usually yeah. very good it was the combination of i guess it might have been philip glass's score with all the all the graphics and and that were unnecessary. Oh yeah, I remember that about that film. The yeah. graphics, like the overly graphic. 
that's another thing that's going on with documentaries. Uh, too many graphics, too many uh, animated sequences, things like that. This is all stuff that popped up post Errol Morris, post uh, 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 Michael Moore, uh, and and given given the success that those two guys have had, everybody is trying to copy it. Uh, I mean, the Errol Morris thing, or, or the documentaries being really heavily scored, really started with Errol Morris and Philip Glass with uh, uh, Thin Blue Line. So, mm-hmm. uh, and then it's it just seems like like you can't just get get the movies just to shut up and 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 show us the story and and stop trying to manipulate us with your music, which isn't even a lot of times isn't even good music. It's just noise in the background. It's like mm-hmm. it's not even effective scoring or whatever. It's just it's just there just to oh here's a sad part. Oh here's an important part. Oh here's an exciting part. Or here's a part with plaintive music in the background to make you feel ooh or whatever. You know, it's like well, especially with somebody on. like Philip Glass. I mean, Philip Glass is the most most monotonous music you could possibly listen to in general. Right, right, right. I, I, I do think he's very talented, and years ago I did see that documentary about Philip Glass that Scott Hicks did, um, and I thought it was interesting. But his scoring, there, there's really no variety in his score, and I'll be the first to tell you that. Like if you listen to Cassandra's Dream or you listen to his Dracula when he, when he rescored the 1931 Dracula, uh, mm-hmm. I mean that's just that's your standard Philip Glass. Da na 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 na. Yeah, I mean, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean you know I think there's better examples of 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 his scoring. I mean even though even though they're all of a piece, and when you when you hear one of his scores and whatever it's in, even if you don't know he's scoring it, once you hear the score, you know it's Philip Glass. But there are some some that are better than others. Like I'm, I still think Koyana Scott is a masterpiece. I still think that that his score for the hours and for Kundun are are mm. great as well. Yeah, uh, they are. Like like a uh, like a, a a shoulder above the rest of them. But um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, you're right about that. I mean, he can, he's got a style, and that's that's it. <laughs> so. 